Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to tonight's Infrastructure Thought Leaders series on engineering principles of designing in precast concrete. My name is Amanda Rogers and I will be your host for this evening. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Tonight's session will focus on building awareness, improving construction design and reducing costs. We will outline how to design in precast concrete, the principles of design for manufacture and assembly, as well as how precast concrete can achieve a reduction in both material costs and construction time. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's seminar is being hosted with our long-standing industry partner, Austral Precast. Austral Precast is a leading provider of high quality and innovative, customizable precast concrete product solutions. Operating from plants located across Australia uses state-of-the-art technology, production techniques and systems Austral Precast produces a diverse range of customised products and precast solutions. Austral Precast services a range of markets, including multi-residential, commercial, industry, community and civil sectors. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Shan Kumar. Sean is a senior structural and innovation engineer and has over 30 years experience working on a range of building and infrastructure projects. Sean's major involvement has been with projects including high-rise commercial, residential, sports venues and industrial projects in reinforced and pre-stressed concrete and steel structures. He has led the design and construction advisory teams at Hickory for the seven-storey modular stellar apartment building in Cockburn, the 17-storey Peppers King modular construction in Perth, and the 44 HBS modular construction in La Trobe Street, Melbourne. He also led the structural innovation team for the development of the new HBS system. In previous roles, Sean worked with John Connell Associates, Connell Wagner, and Oricon for more than 20 years and was involved with a number of Melbourne's most iconic projects, such as Crown Casino, Eureka Tower, and Marvel Stadium. Sean led the HBS Innovation team responsible for design and construction of a number of high-rise buildings, including the national award-winning project, a 45-storey student accommodation, and C2BU H award winner for the 60-storey Collins House fourth slimmest tower in the world. Sean has been awarded as one of the most innovative engineers in 2017 for his involvement with the Latrobe Tower in Melbourne. Recently, Sean was awarded the prestigious John Connell Gold Medal Award 2019 by Engineers Australia, which recognises outstanding contribution to the standing and prestige of the structural engineering profession. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Kumar. Good afternoon. Hope you all are well and keeping yourself healthy. Uh, within the next 30 minutes, uh, I will do my best to cover what we have achieved successfully with precast construction system. What are the lessons that we have learned? You know, we have to um, make ourselves corrected according to the lessons learned, isn't it? That's the second one. And with this precast construction system, what are the innovations? That's the next stage, which is our future, which is innovative construction like prefab. I'm going to talk about that one. And thanks guys for joining us to this webinar series. And um, as, as you can see that at the bottom of my presentation, uh, ESSEC 2020, which is Australasian Structural Engineering Conference, which is happening in uh, 11th of November to 13th of November as a, a virtual 
uh, seminar series and also Swinburne University uh, will have a, a short course on uh, prefab modular. We got th in 30 minutes, you know, we cannot cover everything which is on the 22nd to 25th of September. So let's start to see that, you know, what have we achieved, you know, in uh, with precast construction? A lot. Look at the very first structure. She is pretty tall and slim like a fashion model, the Eureka Tower, which has got so many precast elements in it. And look at the Crown Casino. You would have been there and his enormous number of precast. We have used it. Look at the other one, actually, like uh, standing there, the um, Melbourne Control Tower, which has got precast in it. So you name it. Every single one of them has got the precast elements that we have incorporated. This one is my favorite because this is my very first job in 1988. Look at the construction. Look at the construction. Is There is no change so far, isn't it? You know, we have the jump form system. We have a protective screen, floor framing, facade. Everything is similar. But look at this hotel, which was called at the time as a Sheraton Hotel. Now it is called Langham, but we have very successfully used the transflow precast system, similar to the Austral decking. We have used it very effectively everywhere as a precast system. And the prefabrication, look at that Lutheran church, right around we have got precast, and then we have got the steel precast, and we have that, even the cross was a prefabricated cross, we placed it. And the key west is a 27 story building, it's a curved Lord bearing external precast. We have very successfully done that one. So as engineers, we give ourselves to the community. Look at the construction activities has been treated as an essential service with COVID-19 restriction. Yes, you can't go halfway uh, from the construction site. And I treat engineers is or engineering profession as the best profession in the world. We save people. You know, with the safe design, we can save thousands and thousands, actually. You know, a doctor can save one person at a time. But engineers, we save thousands of people, but we could be very careful in designing a safe structure. We build hospital, we build road bridges, provide shelter to the community, provide clean drinking water. Let's be creative and innovative to build a safe, cost-effective structure in a timely manner. With pre-cost, prefab techniques, engineers can deliver building and infrastructure much quicker than a conventional construction. And you're moving on to the pre-cost construction system, and then you make an innovation prefab construction. I was very fortunate to involve with these uh, systems. I've developed uh, with the Hickory, and I was leading the innovation team, and I've developed so many systems, which is Without precast, I can't imagine without that one, we could have done this one, this fascinating building. We have done so many buildings in precast elements, isn't it? Precast beam columns, if you take Monash Caulfield, it's a 11 story uh, academic office building and a seven story car park. It's all precast. We have got stick joints with core and we have got precast tear. We have got shell beams and then you post tension through the shell beam and we have very successfully used facades in those days the architects loved it is a facade precast but the engineers very cleverly use that as the load bearing element that is the clever design by the engineers using the facade precast to a load bearing element and mini planks you know we have got a sort of pre-stressed mini planks we have used it to you know get rid of the formwork and also this next structure, which is the uh, Melbourne Control Tower, and we can mix and match the construction system. We had a slip form of a stem and the precast uh, uh, funnel. You know, you could see that then the propping is very important with this thing. And also with the prefab construction in Perth, we have used Austral Deck. And this building is my favorite building. It's College Girl on Swanson. It's a brick. Beautiful precast facade. With the precast facade, all these precast elements are facade elements, but very cleverly, we have used that as a load bearing element. And this slip form structure, and then the insulation system is very critical for successful placement of precast element. That is very critical. 
we must explain to the construction crew how we are placing it as engineers. That's we only know about the design part of it, isn't it? Actually, so if you look at this one, I said about the stem is a slip form and the funnel, all of them are precursors, and you get a beautiful building finished with no time. And propping, guys, it is very, very crucial for a safe construction. Propping design and sequencing methodology must be carried out by a qualified erection engineer. We I'm separating from a design engineer and an erection engineer. Very important part that we should note that one. And each and every prop has to be designed for the loads to get a safe construction. And it has got to be a qualified erection engineer. And beautifully finished buildings, you know, we have done that one in a 72 uh, uh, tall um, Melbourne uh, control tower and 45 tall, um, bit short and short and fat, but you know, she's very cute and uh, slip form stem and precast final. So precast smart construction system, what are the things, you know, we have already developed like Transflow, Austral Deck, Coloco, mini planks, ultra flow, bubble deck, pre-stress, pre-stress, plats. Plats have been used in every single stadium in Australia. That is a 12 meter long pre-stress plats. Precast post-tension beam, precast shell beams, precast walls and columns, precast core with stick joints, precast core with bed joints, you name it, we have done it. There is nothing wrong with the process simple smart detailing with the proper qa 100 percent safety we are there but we engineers builders suppliers spe specifiers regulators are the one responsible for any failures we got to make ourselves correct at first so the survival of the precast industry is in our hands guys what are we do doing wrong have we done the detailing right have we done the qa on site Precast is beautiful. Don't kill it with a poor design detail and construction. Grouting QA is very crucial. Very important part in high-rise building. Look at this area. Is that area enough for grouting? For your load bearing precast, taking about 25 stories above? You have to check it. That is very important. And here I have found that it's not grouted. The QA check has to be done. If it is grouted and somebody has forgotten, then a 24-story building sitting on that column, imagine what would happen. And then, you know, these columns, the double height columns, and you've got reinforcement there. That's good, clever design. But have you checked the reinforcement enough for the gust wind load? That is important. And propping, that is the erection engineer's design responsibility. If you do it right, you get the product right. And I said the grouting, isn't it? And I'm telling you, a 25, 30 story building going through that small joint, that poor joint, a 20 millimeter joint. If you don't have enough grout there, what happened to your precast? What happened to your structures? Look at this one. I put it there in a 150 millimeter panel thickness, a bearing length of 58 millimeter only. You get, you're going to get it. Is that enough? That is us to check it. We must check that. So the grouting QA is the very important thing in this high-rise building construction with precast. The next one, we have to concentrate on joints. Every single joint is very important. Look at this one, right? You have a precast, precast one below and a precast column above, precast wall and a column. How many dowel bars has to go into the column and the precast wall? That's the, we, it is the engineer's responsibility. We can't let the shop detail decide on that one. You, he will get it wrong. So it is our responsibility to make sure that all the dowels that is required passing from the wall to column or column to wall, it is our responsibility. So guys, you know, joints, 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 detailing, detailing, detailing. Do it right, nothing can go wrong. Look at it. Then it's the detail. I said the grout, then I said the joint, now the detail. We have to simplify the detail. If you simplify the detail, you get a good product. Standardize the Rio and Dowers. In a in a co-wall, high-rise co-wall, why can't you standardize the Rio? 
Okay, you standardize the Rio and find your hotspot and put some additional Rio. That's the way. So look at this example I have given you. This is very, very clearly marked that reinforcement and leaks. And then we have the dowels, everything put together. That's fine. But when you go on the next floor, can you see the leaks are all over the place? How can you get your grout tube going through there? If you let it go like that, what you will get it, you know, the the shop detailer would have put their dowels in certain places and you would have sent that to the site and it won't match. The bottom and the top dowel don't match and you'll be called to drill holes and waste of your energy, waste of time. It is not the good construction. So we need to check this is our duty to make sure that detailings are run properly. And another example I have given you is uh, wall beams. You know, in, uh, in high rise construction, we have been using this wall beam very good, very good uh, design methods of using wall beam, strut and tie method. But you know, 180 to 200 wall has got a 10 and 32 and cog both sides won't work. Very. We must ensure that these reinforcement can be placed within that limit. It is not only that reinforcement and you have got a, you know, 50 to 60 diameter grout tube as well, isn't it? So we must ensure all these things are detailed properly we must sketch it and see you know whether it everything fits together and pro coordinations you know the ground tube and the lifting eye you know we have to coordinate properly and tell the shop detailer you know how much of spacing you need so if you can sketch and draw it it will certainly work structurally and also it is buildable too shop drawings if it is the sections you need to do more sections explain to the detailer, shop detailer, you know, loan let, let him guess what he wants. What are the reinforcement has to pass through? You know, what is the congestion going to happen there? Make it easy for the construction and do some section and understand. Will it work until you develop and detail and draw it? You don't know any doubt, doubts, you know, test it. You can test it. That is, that is important. So innovation, smart construction, precast, prefab, Think about this one. Which elements are repeatable, right? Or modularized? That is very important, isn't it? Standardize those things. Which elements are off-site constructible? We have to identify that one. Are they transportable? You've got to make sure size, weight, height, you know, everything. Identify the critical path elements because you can't transport the whole lot, isn't it? Weight is going to be more and more. So we must identify the critical path and transport them. Is jump form necessary to achieve the required cycle? If not, why can't we use precast core? Think about it. Maximize the crane's uses. Sometimes you have to maximize the crane uses, get a permit in the night to bring all of your night work. And during daytime, you can have your precast installed and nighttime you can do your module install. Slice the building into many. When I say slice, you know, you're going to think what it is. You know, I'm saying, you know, break into pieces. It's a Lego pieces in a break into manageable portion so that you can lift and transport and place. You know, that is the important part. You could think about it. How do we connect the joint element? It has got to be easy, smart, structurally feasible. You know, you know, my, my, you know, I always think it has got to be a, you know, dumb smart, we call it as, because anybody can sort of join them. So joint connections are very critical for the success. Bed joints, stick joints, dowel joints, stress joints is very important for you all to design and detail. Grouting is the main joint structural element. It, it is a small one, but she don't let her stress. You know, they, it has got to be done properly. So for innovations to prosper, precast construction must continue. Our standards and regulars, regulators should recognize this one. Develop your connection. Think it. Detail it. Draw it. Modify it, think it, detail, draw it. It's the development, you know. You think about it and modify it to suit your connection details. And if you can draw it, it can be designed. Remember these guys, if you can draw it, it can be designed, it can be built. Why not use PT? You know, bridges, you know, big bridges, you know, portions, they have used it and post tension. You know, why can't you use the same system in buildings as well? Joint detailing development is important. So we start with the wet joints. So wet joints means, you know, you pour concrete, you need formwork. 
is needed. Then we develop something like a nib so that you don't need the form work. So it is, a, it is what we are doing is the reduction in on-site work and we are giving more off-site work. You know, that is the uh, think, thinking we have to think about it, how we can make off-site work big portions, right? You know, so we have to start thinking about the detailing part of it, actually. It is my favorite shot, actually. You know, it's, you know I worked in the very first job in 1988, and then this is another you know, prefab job. So that is a precast job. It is a prefab job in 2019. It is the performance requirement that uh, NCC is now allowing you to do it. So you can test it, whatever the product, whatever the joints, whatever the construction you're doing, now you can test it with the performance solution. And also AS 37 2018 allows innovative construction. They have recognized innovative construction has to be go along. So the performance solution being now accepted, you know, you don't need to go to the, just the deem to satisfy according to the code of practice, but you can do test. So we have done test. Now you've got to select your joints, very important selecting where you have your joints, isn't it? That is very critical because you don't want that joint to be stressed more than what you think, right? So you can do some tests and then you can um, do better jobs. Precast is beautiful when you design, detail and construct correctly. You know, st stacking, clearly identifying panels, all of them are very important. One most important thing if you make a mistake in the factory, make sure that you rectify that panel before it's sending it out. Look at it. If you send it out and they have to rectify on a level 45, you think about, you know, their problem, you know, the safety of those people who are rectifying on site. So like a pre poor inspection, we must have a post poor inspection and rectify before dispatch them uh, to the site. PT slabs, you know, you can use the two-way PT slabs, you know, that's on. And core, you know, you know that, you know, the corners are the structural engineers know that the corners are the important part of your stability system. So make sure that if you can make that corner or even you can make a C-section, what would, that would be the ideal thing that you can do it. You've got to program it, think about the transport and lifting, you know, how we can transport it, how we can place it, how we can join it. That is the important part. You know, just a simple, how, then we have to make sure we explain this one to the site crew, project managers, everyone should understand what you are thinking of it. Then you can tell your success story. Then a prefab innovations, guys, I want to take some time to explain a few of the case studies. We have done marvelously well with the precast systems. We have used it on a prefab construction. You know, it's a 44 story building and it could have been, uh, it would have taken 27th or more time with conventionally to finish in 19 months. It is a simple thing. You have a base of concrete uh, base and then uh, steel frame. Uh, structural design, you have uh, all those structurally designed uh, modulars, and then you have a uh, precast and shot create, precast and shot create in the end. And it is the shop drawings is very important. Now it is digitalized and we have got beam modeling, you name it, you know, people have so much of you advanced so much. So we don't have problem with, you know, making beam modeling and things like that. So this is a precast composite floor, pre-installed reinforcement. You can bring it everything that offsite construction is important and temporary bracing, you know, that is very important for transportation. And if you look at a structural system, what we have done is a 150 precast. And then we brought the module with reinforcement and joined with the shot creek. Very first time in Australia, we have used shot creek to join the precast and the module. And these two sites are uh, with facade, which act as a protective screen as well during construction. It's a lightweight concrete floor and pre-assembled curtain wall and fully finished bath pot as well. And these are the spine structural element walls, which are shot creek. We bring the reinforcement, bring this one side form work and shot created and it worked pretty well actually and this is the factory production what you're looking at and then i told you about sliding if you need more load bearing element what we do is we slide the precast through the uh, through this gap and then bolt it 
So successfully finished, the set is there. Daytime, we bring in all the precast, internal and external precast, and the nighttime, this monster, we bring that monster. It's a 17 meter by four and a half meter, three meter high module, 20 ton being lifted in the night. It's a pretty simple uh, placement during night. And we also do the stair, bring the stair, and then, you know, you don't need to have any temporary stair. Successfully finished this lateral project, and then we had this 10 months contract for 17 level uh, in Perth, where we have all external wall precast, and then the spine wall is a precast, and then the core is a precast core. And uh, in a bathroom pots again, that is a modul modularized bathroom pots. And you can see developing the uh, connection is very important. You know, the wet joints are sometimes very long. That's the people don't like it, you know, 1.2 meters to 1.4 meters, you know, Using the uh, AS3600 development of the length of head reinforcement in tension, we can reduce that one to about 700. That is, that's a smart way of thinking what you can do with uh, this connection. But, you know, perfect example is you must produce that one on site, you know, exactly what you need. That is the important part, the need joint. And then you can see that, you know, how uh, important is a prefab construction within that 12, 12 meter footprint, you know, that's, you know, you've got building there, building there, this was a piece of cake to put that 12 and a half meter long uh, prefab modular. That's a finished product. And then we moved on to a 50 lateral street. It's a 45 story building. Uh, and uh, this is the, and I could have, this point I could tell you, the first thing we have to do is the crane because the crane radius, how much we can lift. So if then you slice the module, I said about slice, slicing into pieces, precast floor, precast floor, precast wall, precast core, precast um, wall, you know, all everything is precast. And then you do some in-situ joints, isn't it? Join them with in-situ construction. So you are reducing the on-site work, isn't it? You know, that's what it, that's your shop drawing, you know, a very this shop drawing has to be done properly and then site construction you can see the facade is connected first to your the the uh, slab is poured and then the uh, the precast is connected and you can see that uh, very smart clean joints on site and you can see the pre-installed facade and we have we bring the props also you can see just the building goes up with the facade you don't see any other thing any protective screen or anything like that. And the next one I want to just discuss with you that is a um, 60 story building, it's a Colin house. Uh, and again, crane capacity, you need to do that. You know what the crane can do that so that we, I can slice these um, uh, modules. It is about four and a half meter cantilever. So I need to bring that back to connect to the back uh, back of the building you know people ask me i said you know these are the best things for the structural engineer it's 11 meter backspan and four and a half meter uh, uh cantilever if you put a module there it can't go anywhere isn't it you know structural engineers know that the backspan problem so that is the uh um we produce of course the beam modeling to explain what's happening this is a side work you know i just put this one this is the simple detail uh which i drew you know is constructed this building it is a it is a simple drawing you know one sketch you know think about that one and on site bring that one and that's a monster that's the big uh, um uh cantilever module that we we are placing that one to the collins house it is a collin house is the third slimmest in the world you know that's right and i said told you this is a four and a half meter cantilever above a 15 story building, a heritage building. And this is 11 meter backspan. I told you about that one, isn't it, right? And and everything is precast. This is precast, that is precast, the core is precast and prefab modules and then stitch with in-situ portions. So when you do that, we have got design consideration, isn't it? The final in-place design is no different to the conventional construction. If deemed to satisfy doesn't work, AS 3600 2018 and NCC 2019 allows you to do some prototype testing. It's a performance-based solution. Temporary condition might govern. You know, you must make sure transportation lifting may govern the design. Ensure that structure is cap capable of protecting the facade elements, the brittle structure. You must have some uh, articulated joints and bracing and things like that for during lifting. If unsecure um, if you are unsure about that one, please carry out a prototype, 
prototype testing because you're lifting it for 20, you know, 40, 50 story building. Lifting and transport requirements will dictate the size and finish of the module. That is very important. Viability need more repeated flows to achieve the full benefit, better suited for apartment building and hotel. And more projects in the pipeline is a bonus, but we have to convince the government the prefab is our future. So they should regulate, in, regulate something so that a portion of the building should be a prefabricated structure. Like Singapore, in China, they are putting where at least 30% of their structures should be uh, prefabricated structures. Um, and most importantly, lessons learned and improvement is the key to that. And we have to learn the lessons. You know, safety is more important. Fail safe system is the language I always use as to save the people. Even if the buildings cracks and fails, we have to save the people. That is our theme. Prefabrical structure, what's the key benefit? High rise building can be manufactured off site as a series of structural units or modules, which can be then transported to construction site and assembled with less time labor uh, than a conventional institute approach. Majority of the construction work is performed in a controlled factory environment. Is a QA is important, isn't it? Which reduces the, the downtime to inclement weather, improves personal safety. He doesn't have to construct a, a 44 throwing on the 44 the high. You know, it, it can be constructed in the ground floor by reducing the need to work heights and allow for quality control checks to be implemented more effectively compared to conventional cost institute construction system. Offsite manufacturing reduces the overall logistic burden on site as the majority of the construction materials can be delivered to the point of fabrication rather than delivering to the raw material to a congested building site with a small site footprint and limited area of site. That's, you know, this is, look at, you know, Collins Street and William Street corner it is a congested site. Yeah, I'm looking at this. Comparing that one, if you look at the conventional, we have a facade, floor construction, protected between jump form compared to uh, this thing, you know, it's all facade come with that one. And the construction starts with, uh, this is a conventional and this is prefabricated with core tough, isn't it? That's the beauty. The timing as already explained, you know, with 20, 30%, we save on time. In conclusion, what does the system of people ask, Sean, what have you done? Have you saved money? I said to people, reducing construction time is money. Substantial reduction in wastage is money. Safe working environment is money. High quality product, money. Greener product, money. 20 to 30 percent material serving is money. If you design detail and construct correctly, precast construction is the best system for construction of building and infrastructure. Survival of the precast system is in our hands, guys. With that, I give you some essential references, very important. AS 3600, AS 3850, Guide to Tilt of Design and Construction by CA and CNCA, National Code of Practice for Precast and Tilt of Victorian Blue Book, and Understanding of Precast Joints, very important. Guide to Engineers prepared by National Precast Concrete Association, uh, and, uh, and there are enormous wealth of knowledge around you. It is you have to you know, think about and using it. You know, just to remind you again, you know, ESSEC conferences are 13th to 11th of November uh, 2020, and also Swinburne is going to conduct a prepared module structure course uh, uh, from 22nd September to, sep September to 25th September. Look for it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Sean, for your presentation. I would now like to welcome our second speaker, Joe Thompson. Joe is a passionate engineer constructor, team builder, and project leader. Over the past 25 years, Joe's construction resume includes a diverse range of building and infrastructure projects in the UK, Hong Kong, and Sydney. Since 2006, Joe has been at the center of a drive to improve construction efficiency through off-site manufactured components and specifically structural precast elements in reinforced concrete structures. Witnessing firsthand the successes and failures at project level, Joe is enthusiastic about sharing those experiences with fellow engineers and industry professionals. Please welcome Joe Thompson.
Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, this evening, where we're going to discuss the engineering principles of designing and precast uh, concrete. Hello, and I am Joe Thompson. A little bit about myself. I was a 10 years main contractor in the UK, worked for Sir Robert McAlpine. Uh, in that period, what, what my observation was when buildings weren't going too well, it was mainly because the structure wasn't going too well and we weren't allowing enough time at the end for the fit out phase. So uh, I decided I wanted to do something about that. And in 2006, after 10 years, I decided to focus on, you know, how to make uh, structures better. So I joined a uh, reinforced concrete frame subcontractor, which was actually a group company of Langer Rock. So my experience with Langer Rock started in 2006, and I spent five years in the UK with them. As part of that, because I was a, a structure specialist, I, uh, I did a thing with Bison Manufacturing. That was a probably the UK's biggest um, precast manufacturer, particularly of Holocore, or the bespoke structures, um, in 2009. And, and that was great because I got to tour the, the length and breadth of the country, learning about uh, the different precasts uh, people were doing um, in the UK and Scotland. Uh, 2011, I was fortunate enough to go to Hong Kong for a six year stint on the West Kowloon Terminus South. And I've been in March uh, from March 2017 to date. So I'll be I'll be brief on my topic. So I'll very quickly cover uh, why precast. Um, in in basic terms, what are the opportunities for precast? And then we'll go into a little bit more detail of uh, what I consider the golden rules of uh, DFMA or Design for Manufacturing Assembly to be. So first of all, why precast? Um, you look at the photographs, they'll, they'll be a sight familiar to many people, unfortunately, who've been in the construction industry for, uh, for a period of time. Um, we, particularly in, in reinforced uh, concrete structures, we, we use an inordinate amount of uh, temporary materials to build the permanent structure. And when we do that, we have a massive wastage of it. Uh, we have Scenes like those, unfortunately, you're not looking at a scaffold collapse there, you're looking at what people think is a reasonable way of, of um, striking formwork. Um, in addition to the waste of temporary materials, of course, we've got the, the waste of the permanent materials as well. You know, three to five percent of, of uh, concrete wastage is not uncommon, probably similar with reinforcement as well. Uh, why go down a precast route? Well, one, one, route, one reason certainly is improve the quality. Manufacture things in a factory environment, it is always going to be much, much better than anything subject to the vagaries of weather and, uh, and uh, yeah, improve safety. The, um, yeah, the, the idea around that is if we reduce the amount of activities that we do, then we can take a greater effort in controlling those reduced amount of activities. So that's the, really the principle behind uh, getting uh, better safety. Improve productivity and efficiency. So uh, when we when we use when we build concrete structures, we, we tend to use cranes, um, usually sort of tower cranes. You know, tower cranes can only do 50, 60, 80, 100 lifts a day. Question is, uh, to make the industry better, how do we get more out of every time a crane um, swings or lifts? So it's a big driver to improve that productivity. And uh, last of all, if we get the, in, the improvements of productivity and efficiency, the chances are we're going to get a high degree of program certainty. What are the opportunities for precast then? So in real basic terms, we've got floors and slabs, um, solid, solid floor planks there, uh, lattice, uh, which is a 70 millimeter or thereabouts uh, concrete wafer, embedded reinforcement and um, lattice uh, to help with the temporary condition of, of that for movement. Uh, and then when we add the top reinforcement later and the in-situ topping. Uh, we've got Holocore down there. Probably the most uh, off-the-shelf precast uh, product there is, made in long, long lengths and cut to uh, to your requirements. Many different floor systems. Uh, columns, I always laugh at this one because when I joined Langer Rock in 2006, this is one of the first things I saw. Uh, a gentleman called Mick Joblin, who was, who's, and still is so far ahead of the curve, he did off-site manufacturing on-site. So that was what we did in the early days, uh, take columns off the critical path, manufacture them in advance and just land them where they needed to be. Most of the time now we opt for the, the offside option and quite right too. Um, probably the main thing to point out there is that's a six metre high column mould. And one of the things people often say is, I've got 20 columns, but they're five different lengths. You know, I don't want to go to a precaster. Um, 
because it's inefficient to have to make five different molds to make those columns. Chances are the precaster has got a, a long mold and uh, can adjust the length of that mold. So the point of that story is go and speak to the precasters if you are uh, considering a precast solution. Nice and simple propping and, and uh, of course you can see the massive gain in quality you get when you, when you do that in the factory environment. Walls. So we're looking at uh, double wall systems there. And just take a pause for a moment and, and just look at that and picture if you're going to do that in, in situ concrete and how different that scene would look. Uh, every bay would be filled with scaffold, we'd have formwork, we'd have reinforcements on top of the scaffold ready to go into the walls. It just looks completely different. And that's probably three or four hours work to land all of those walls. So you've got the double wall system with the cavity in the middle, solid wall panels, and, um, and anything you do with the wall, you can you can you know extend that principle and use it in, for example, a lift shaft. You could extend it a little bit more and look at uh, external facade systems, and they can be structural or or non-structural. Uh, that's uh, Manchester School there with a um, strip panel, uh, Imperial College, I think it is. And then this is a school down in Barnsley that does actually use a, a structural wall system. And there's real, you know, you can go wild with creativity on this. You've got basic punched hole windows in an in external facade panel, uh, a bit more complicated, vertical strips with curtain wall and systems. And then, you know, you really, the, the sky's the limit almost with that. So that's a real basic overview of what we can use DFMA or, or precast in particular for. Um, what I'm going to do now is go through the golden rules of DFMA and the important thing about this is they're the golden rules according to Joe Thompson. So please do bear that in mind because I know many of you watching this will have a very different opinion to mine. All I'm expressing is what has and what has not worked for me. I use a couple of case studies to do that. Uh, the first one we're going to go through Durham University which I did um, when I was a, a, a subcontract um, for PM. Four-story library building design and construct contract. Uh, there was two buildings on that project. The second one was much, much bigger. Um, so this one was not on the critical path. Uh, innovation was support to the clients, as university um, clients tend to be actually. Um, the dictum from the company was, this is all gonna be precast, uh, unless you come up with a very good, good excuse why it could not be precast. And I couldn't come up with any good excuses. So every single element of that building was precast. Uh, the main standout items were 40 meters high uh, exposed columns, um, single span from top to bottom. Um, they supported a curved on plan flying feature staircase. It looks like it just you know sits there in midair. Uh, double height exposed walls that you can see on the left of that picture, and it was exposed to feet throughout. So a super super high quality uh, requirement and a real drive to get everything uh, here for made. Uh, the other one is, is um, uh, West Gillington, is Hong Kong, where I was looking to be in 2011. Um, just big figures on that. There's a one and a half million, uh, me million meter cube bulk excavation phase. We did build that top down, um, so slab and grade on, on plunge columns, uh, excavating underneath it, each slab and going down and down and down. Um, the, so there's four levels of that. Each, each level is about 44,000 square meters. Um, a key thing, and one of the things we'll touch on here, is that we've got a very late variation for a new ground floor slab and a transfer slab above that, which was constructed in parallel with the West Colin Terminus Structure Works as that went down below. So a real logistical um, headache. There was no contractor design at uh, WKT. That's really important to point that out. But what, what the client absolutely supported was anything that led to a program gain. Um, Luckily, the instruction came after a few years of us being there, so there was a real level of trust that developed by, by that time, and we really went hard at the DFMA strategy. As a result of that, we got about 55,000 tons of precast into that scheme. Um, I just want to point out this. So, you know, the, the, the usual thing is, is we approach the construction phase of a project, you know, our ability to change things gets less and less with time, and if we do change things, those things get more and more expensive with time. Uh, but the key thing is here, um, so don't worry too much about the text, is the red line represents what the design curve needs to be when you're looking at a DFMA solution. The, the black line is, is the traditional approach where you can take, you, you know, uh, decisions perhaps a little bit later. Um, DFMA is fully integrated design, absolutely including everything to do with construction as well. So it has to be much, much further ahead 
than it would be traditionally and think in terms of six months or, or more. So the golden rules, according to Joe Thompson. So the first one is transportation. Um, and I always think of that, that's the silent T in DFMA. I really think it should be in there. But you've really got to think very carefully about transportation. The premium is um, have something that can go in a standard load. And that means the width of the trailer, the length of the trailer, generally not greater than three meters high and under 22 tons. So you don't need escort vehicles. You don't need to do it to, in off-peak timings. Um, it, it's just much, much simpler. And if it's simpler, it means it's, it's cost effective. Precast is really effective as long as you don't um, add cost to it. And it compares very favorably commercially if, if you don't do that. Um, that said, on West Kowloon Terminus, we were right next to the harbour. Um, there was such a, a volume of excavated material come out there. That was a necessity. 8,000 tonnes a day went out by barge. Uh, luckily, that gave us a great opportunity to bring precast units as well. So, you, you know, you need to look at uh, the situation that, that, that you're faced with and uh, what opportunity you can make of that. So that was great for us. There was no real limit on, on what we could put into an incoming barge. Um, the, the unit size was mainly limited by the size of the crane that we could put on the quayside, which was limited by it being close to the quayside and a fairly fragile sea wall. Um, form and shape. So I'd like to talk about form and shape and, and give you some context. I'm going to use these overhead track exhaust units as, uh, as, as the basis of the comparison. So remember, we constructed WKT top down. B1, B2, B3, B4. You're looking at the B3 slab there and the B4 slab below it. Um, so we had to figure out a way of doing an awful lot of, of these OTEs. Um, and when I say an awful lot, I mean an, an awful lot. 3.3 kilometers in total of those OT structures across the 15 lines that were at the lower, lowest level of the structure. So a real, real challenge. Designed as in situ, um, but this, this is one of the first areas that, where, where we looked at a real different solution. So there was 10 different types of, of OTEs, but they broadly fell into these three categories here. So you can see the, the first one had a U-shape, second one an H-shape. Uh, for reference, the, the H-shape is about 4.2 meters tall and uh, just under five meters wide, and they were about five tons. And you can see there, and I've highlighted them green deliberately, uh, that they've got inherent stability. You could um, land them on something, you can lift them to a different location, and you don't need to do anything to them. They are stable structures. And you compare that to uh, the Y-shaped um, units, that's where it butted up against a column and a wall line, so it didn't need that, that second leg. Just how difficult that is in comparison, I remember. Same height, four meters. Um, that presents a challenge um, all across the piece. So to demonstrate that a bit more by example, this is the process that uh, those particular OTs went through. So arrived by barge, that's the, the photograph from before, lifted onto the quayside by a crane. There's a temporary support on the barge, there's a temporary support on the quayside. It's then transported across to the WKT, which requires a truck with its own support system. It's landed into storage on the, on the B1 slab of the WKT, again needs a frame. It's lifted down from B1 to B4 through a mole hole onto a vehicle which has a support frame until it finally arrives at its destination where it can be lifted up to the, the feet of the slab. So in all, that one single precast unit from barge to placement uh, in position required five separate support systems. And it's a real consideration. Connections. Now connections is massively, massively important. I was speaking to Dr. Shani yesterday Whereas I say simple connection details, Sean has a very simple saying, which is just connections, connections, connections. It is a real important part of the detailing of precast structures. So it's easier to show what is not good than, than what is good, but I'll, I'll try and show you what is good. These are uh, about 10 meter wide beams and they're sat on um, the Giba bearings, which sit on the in-situ structure. So, you know, not a great deal of complication, lifted in independently onto the Magiba bearings, grouted up, really, really nice and simple. And then the second part of that process, if you just follow the mouse, is the uh, transverse slabs, which just sit onto these nice wide sills that were created deliberately on those beams. So loads of tolerance, um, no, no real, real worry. And you can just tell by the lack of um, 
complication. You, you can see it, it doesn't have complication. You know, bars are not excessively long. Um, they don't span greatly beyond the, the, the length of the units themselves. This is another good example. So this is just Brica slabs on top of a, a steel frame. You can just make that out there. Again, it looks simple, and if it looks simple, it's good. Um, using the OT as an example again. So if you just, um, you might be able to see there, you've got, so you're looking at the B3 slab, and those are vertical 40 millimeter dowel bars. So the connection of that 24 ton unit for the ceiling uh, of B3 was just three simple dowel bars per side. And you can see that the access holes in the side of the, of the OTE unit just allowed a person to get in there. Uh, the, the, the bar appeared, screw the washer on, and then ultimately we just uh, grouted those pockets up. Of course, there was a lot of them, but it was um, a great, simple solution. Loads of tolerance and very rarely they went wrong. These are not simple connection details. So this is the uh, 14 meter columns that were at the front of the um, library in, in Durham University. Uh, and you can see there, now uh, the principle was uh, Lenton coupler interlock system, so grouted pockets, um, the extended bars of one column section going into those pockets and then they were grouted. The problem is with anything that's um, bespoke, um, the, these are bespoke, you are reliant on, on individuals, on human beings, assembling these um, um, reinforcement cages, putting them into a mold, closing the mold, pouring concrete, and all of that going 100% perfectly. Uh, we looked at all different options um, to do that, um, many, many options, but we just, because it was exposed the whole way up, they didn't want visible collars, uh, this was the only way that it could be done. And it, it did create an awful lot of problems. And you can see in the top right hand corner there, those bars simply did not uh, meet the ones up below, and that happened on quite a few occasions. Um, another one, it did kind of good and bad, those are those very same columns, you've got the vertical um, column there between the two joints and uh, what you can see there is uh, an, an in-cast uh, steel beam. So again, you're, you're reliant on somebody putting that within a cage, putting it in the mould and getting all of that right. Um, so you had a visible steel plate at the front onto which a horizontal uh, beam was attached. The, the next stage of that process was the lattice slab, which is in the bottom right hand corner there, was slid underneath that, reinforcement added uh, over the top, and then the whole lot um, was, was precast. So, got the result. Um, very, very difficult to achieve. Quite, quite a number of units had to be scrapped. Um, yeah. Temporary works. So the key thing is here is understanding the full process of temporary works from the very start to the very finish. So we're looking at the lovely line of the, the double wall system there, nice simple props, two props um, per, per column. What's on the other side of that, because the, this is down in the, in the basement, again, at, um, uh, Durham, um, is we need, there's a requirement to backfill those walls very, very quickly. So concrete, waterproof, backfill really, really fast. It meant we had to keep the props in. So the second stage was we needed to add um, formwork for the horizontal elements, which were landed very, very quickly after that process took place. In fact, in parallel with the, with the backfill going on. So you can see there, super simple, but the second stage was that's quite difficult. And then to take away those things, obviously, is, is just a bit more difficult. Um, if you remember the first slide, you know, what one of the aims is, is trying to reduce the amount of temporary works on site. I can't say we've really, really achieved that. Um, it's all a good learning exercise, isn't it? Um, but the, it, one of the successes was the, the double height, um, double wall panel. Uh, and that was just two propping rows, one lower and one upper. Four props, super simple. You know, those walls went in within a morning. And again, you compare that to what that would have been uh, on an in situ wall. Last one here is um, systems like double wall are open-ended. You, you can't close off the gaps, so you can either put them into a wall going the other direction, or you can set a plywood, which could be fixed in the factory. There's a few alternatives to do that. Uh, or you can do flying corners there. What that sometimes means is uh, you've got an extended leaf, which is not reinforced by, by the lattice, uh, and you've got to reinforce that externally. And that's what we've just done there. There's a metal bracket on the edge of that corner, just to reinforce the corners we, we fill it with concrete. Um, a little example here from West Carling Terminus, um, so that's a 3D view of, of just the beam arrangement. So some of that is in situ, but it just gives you an idea of the beams. 
and we're typically looking at this this central zone here. So around about 1.6 by 1.6 in situ beams, um, which you can see that, that that layout of those there. The, the, the key part of this is you can see those brackets, and you can see those in the bottom of here. And what you can make out is the bottom of a double T beam. This area was absolutely critical to the project. Remember, we were still constructing the, the, the WKT much lower as we were doing this. Uh, what, what that simple thought allowed us to do was to land the double T units on top of those in situ beams and not have any formwork on that level. So you can see concrete going in there uh, and going down to the B4 level with the ongoing construction. And just, just a view there of what that looked like um, overall. So again, thinking much, much further in advance, what do you need for the temporary works? Because you're going to need to put that into the design of the precast units. Lifting arrangements. Again, it's my rule, but uh, avoid lifting frames where possible. When we got the, uh, the uh, MTR design for, for this, it featured a massive lifting beam with multiple drop points to support that along the entire length. Uh, we said to MTR, it would have meant about four to seven different lifting frames, I think it was. Uh, can we review the design? Can we, can we add to the reinforcement? Can we make it stronger such that we can um, you know, pick it up at the, the external points early, four, four points of lifting? It was absolutely well worth the effort, not, not least because this crane was operating with the station below. We were right on the limit. Uh, that's a 120 ton capacity crane. That's a 60 ton beam uh, of what we could do on that floor. So you, you couldn't have even added four tons. Other solutions are for lattice plank, these, these nice equalizer chains that they can be quite effective. Um, yeah, spend the money, um, spend the money to get that benefit is, is my suggestion. Uh, like every other rule that I said, I frequently break it. Um, <laughs> this one, this this one here is uh, you, you can see the lifting frames that we use for those OTU, OTU units, but they were quite adaptable, so that that was probably worthwhile. And they were quite fragile; they're only two hundred uh, millimeters thick or thereabouts. Um, bit of innovation down on the B four level when replacing the precast platform units, we used a a, a uh, an adapted. Uh, Four container kind of level forklift system, and that was that was really effective and fast. And those those units flew in uh, at about the rate of ten a day, so thirty five linear meters of completed platform easily every day with each piece of plan we had. Um, OTs were a lot more more difficult. This was a bespoke engineered unit that took about fourteen months total from concept to creation. Um, the all you had to do was land the precast unit on top of that, then it would jack it to the ceiling up to the threaded rods and then operatives would just tighten those, those threaded rods. So again, very much worth the investment. Casting services. Um, again, if you can, avoid it. So you're looking at the ground floor side of the Durham Gateway building there and this, all of this galvanized tray is, is service containment. Um, it just, one of the benefits is, is of, of DFMA is just how quick you can make it. So that's, that's a floor sub of around about 36, 42 units. And you could literally place that in, in, in one day with, with a really, really well drilled team. So it doesn't make that much sense to then add two or three days beyond that, adding cable tray, um, adding conduit um, and all of the other things. Um, avoid if possible. Uh, another thing you can see there is that we, I'm sure many of you have used bubble deck. We, uh, similar thing really, it's just a polystyrene void former um, took away from some of the weight of the structure, just unnecessary. Simple is usually best, there's no doubt about that statement, or whatever it applies to. Just out of interest there, uh, I've just highlighted the, the arrangement of those lattice plans. You can see that the, the beam line um, placed that way, and then perpendicular to that, is, uh, is the planks in the other direction. That's how it works. Um, and on that, so we're now looking at the underside of, of, of that. Tolerance is, is a, it, it's just, just something to be aware of. Um, precast can be made to brilliant tolerances. That, that there's no two ways about it. But you, you know, you've got um, all, all the different systems. You've got bow, you've got uh, out of parallel, you've got length, um, so many different things coming together that if you're trying to achieve a 10 millimeters gap on every side of a precast unit, the chances are you're not going to do it. Um, we didn't try that at, uh, at Durham. We, we did take some advice and uh, we looked at, um, at doing, doing something a little bit different. So you just see again the, uh, the, the layout of those planks. 
that's that's what we chose to do. So it's a little bit of a dark photograph, but what, what you can see is along the beam line, we've got a, a DFMA um, services cage, uh, just lifted up and uh, bolted to the ceiling, and that just goes over the uh, the joints between the planks that span between the columns. So what it meant was the real effort could go into making these beautifully parallel, such that every single one of these joints was that was that dream ten millimeter joint, and it looked really effective from the feet. Take care is, is the advice on that. If you're going to do it, it's a bold step. You will give yourself problems. Try and look at smart solutions around it. Um, but you know, uh, the summary is precast is pretty fantastic. You know, from a quality lack of um, materials on site, there is gain absolutely across the piece. This is looking up, uh, and that's sort of 600 meters away to the to the northern part of the terminus, which was done by a separate joint venture to ours. And just how wonderful those um, OTs looked when they were um, completed, and very little finishing done to that. And that's how they arrived, and uh, and that's how they stayed, and that's that's how they look now. And the other one was um, Durham University. If you, and it's difficult to describe that point there, but, uh, but that's the effect. There's no additional supports. You've got the beams supported there on the landing levels, uh, and it just seems to sit there in midair. Uh, I, I also was quite ashamed to add um, timber and carpets and, and everything else because I, I think it looks fantastic and I hope you do too. But a, a great result, no doubt a lot of stress with that uh, and an awful lot of learning from that. And that's the, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening to me and uh, look forward to your questions with Dr. Shah. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for your presentation. That was fantastic. Um, our speakers will now come together to take questions from our audience. Uh, please send in any questions for the panel uh, by the chat box on the screen, ensuring you provide your name and who the question is for. Um, also want to thank everybody that took the time to ask questions on registration. Um, that was great. Um, we do have an important question that actually was asked a few times, but um, I will use Brendan, who asked this question from Victoria. And Brendan is asking, uh, with the changes to AS 3600, um, this has had a significant um, changes to precast design. Uh, the increase requires additional reinforcement, dowels, etc., due to the changes added in section 14. This is likely to limit the application for precast on mid-rise buildings. How are you approaching these design changes to ensure efficient design? In AS 3600 2018, in the prefabricated section, it states that you shall not be solely reliant upon friction to resist sliding actions. However, in AS 3850, it states that friction forces shall not be used to resist any parts of these forces, which contradicts AS 3600-2018. The changes to AS 3600 appear to align with ACI and other standards around the world in design, which code takes precedent, which code takes precedence. The updated AS 3600-2018 or the more stringent AS 3850-2018. And once again, thank you, Brendan. That's a great question. Sean, if you'd like to just set the scene for us there. Right, that's a, that's a pretty long and very important question as well. Let's blame the Christchurch earthquake. <laughs> I'm, I'm just uh, saying that, you know, um, the thing is um, AS 3600 2009 and then um, the Appendix C was the earthquake provisions was uh, brought in as a section 14 um, because to give importance for the earthquake. You know, I'm, I was serious actually about the Christchurch earthquake as well. Um, it put a lot of, um, a lot of, they have put a lot of effort in bringing this code in line with the other codes as well. Um, so section 14, you know, mainly the, I think the Brendan was talking about mainly the boundary elements and, uh, and the thickness also going to be increased uh, uh, because of these uh, stringent requirements. Um, one of the things, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm always sort of blame our, ourselves as structural engineers. We had to get on board early enough because the 2017, they put out the draft code. They put out the draft code. There was not enough 
not enough sort of um, uh, um, 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 uh, comments and you know things from engineers such you know I've been going through around the countries and asking for this commentary so uh, it doesn't mean that you know that we have to have uh, 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 we have to have a stringent code like this but they they you know the code of practice they are trying to make sure that you know uh, is a construction, isn't it? So that's what the code make use of that um, uh, every important part of the uh, learning from Christchurch earthquake and things like that. And mind you, you know, we had a 150 thick wall. People have used it for 44 street story building with uh, one little prior, you know, that's not on anymore, you know, this has taken out. And so to answer that question, there is a commentary coming um, uh, very soon. Um, end of this year, uh, that will sort of um, take out a lot of ambiguity that we have, engineers have at the moment. So we will wait for that one. And and I'm sure that Brendan will be happy to see that um, uh, that that um, uh, commentary. And his second part of the question looks like, and he's comparing the, um, the free and requirement by AS 3600 to 2018 and AS 3850. At the moment, uh, my answer would be, you know, Always the quarter practice, what the quarter practice gives you the minimum requirement. It is your responsibility as the best practice engineers or common sense. So my answer is at the moment, we have no choice. We have to use the most stringent one, which is the AS3850. That would be my answer, uh, um, Amanda. I think um, I'm, I'm sure that and I have answered at least um, to give him a, a, a bit of a, um, a breathing space that there is a, there is coming to solve some of those problems yeah thank you sean and yes it, yeah it was a very long question but uh, i agree a very important one for this subject matter this evening um joe um we've had a question from philip and philip's um up in queensland and uh he's asking will the adoption of bim be an advantage to the increased use of precast in the building industry thank you Thank you, and, and thanks, Philip. And uh, I'll just start off by saying I, I, I've been looking at the comments coming in. I can't re respond to those comments, but th thank you all. Really favourable comments. It looks like Dr. and I got some good information over there, and I'll try and be brief with the response as well. So try and take as many questions. Um, BIM, uh, it, absolutely. I, I don't think it's specific to the use of precast, but as, as a general principle, full stop, uh, BIM is great. Uh, one advantage is you know, I spoke about how the design process has to happen much, much earlier. If you're using BIM, you can visualize and then that all important construction um, elements, construction ability um, that you have to put into that precast design is just easier for people to think of. But, you know, where there isn't a building now, a progress is quite difficult. Um, if you do that, it's, it's much, much better. Um, the second part is, you know, BIM full stop gives rigor. Um, and, and discipline to the design process. Uh, it, it doesn't work magic, you, you have to drive it, um, but it's uh, it's very, very effective when it's well controlled and it allows people to do those inputs and it coordinates those inputs better than anything else we can do. So yes, BIM is good. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Sean, we've had a question from WA, from Vinay, um, who's asking uh, about the future. Will precast Precast concrete be a new norm in future in residential buildings. Why it is well known only in commercial construction at the moment. Uh, I, I think the precast uh, precast means you know you have to have repeatability. You know, in uh, if there is no repetition on that one, uh, precast is not that viable. Right? So we have been using in the commercial building like apartment hotels and things like that because it's a high rise building. There are a lot of repetition, even in infrastructure bridges. If you take that, you know, there are a lot of uh, segmented. Uh, construction which are repeatable so say for example if a single story double story house if you have you know uh, hundreds and hundreds of house the same 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 house definitely you know precast is the economic solution it was you know we, you know if you take the car industry you know i think joe mentioned about de design for manufacturing and assembly dfma process you know they make one car one car and they they produce millions of car but here in, us, in in everywhere, we we spend about three hundred million on Adelaide Royal Hospital, which is beautiful, but we don't repeat that. 
you know, we go to another, another things, you know. We have to standardize. We have to make sure that, you know, one of those uh, prototype thing, a hospital, can be repeated everywhere in Australia. Why not? Why can't we do that? Then precast, prefab is the best. If you don't have, if you can't repeat it, I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a viable solution. So you had to go for the high rise building, you know, that's right. Joe, you have, you wanted to comment on that one? I would... Oh, you... no, I, I, that's, that's great. Fully agree with Sean, yeah. Yeah, that's what, that's what, is, you know, for his answer. If it is repeatable, definitely precast is the answer. No way, yeah. Thank you for that. Thanks, Sean. Um, we've had a question from Ariel. Uh, who is asking if a structural precast wall has to be dismantled for renovation or modifications, will it affect the overall stability of the structure? And how about punching some holes in a precast slab when required? Um, who would like to pick that one up? Uh, you want me to do that, or Joe, you want to go with that? Yeah, and then I'll add if, uh, if necessary. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 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 all right. So. So structural, when you, when you have structural walls, there are two types of structural walls. Like one is the load-bearing elements. We call it as a load-bearing elements, right? And also the lateral stability elements. So we've got to be very carefully look at that particular wall when they remove that, whether it is taking uh, load-bearing acting as a st lateral stability wall. That is the important part. So when you remove any structure, the very first thing you've got to make sure it is whether it is load-bearing, whether it is a lateral resisting element or both it can be both right so so we have to do the support and things like that punching punching through that one uh, hole and things like that it is on but you got to strengthen that one definitely you have to look at the design and strengthen that uh, precast element you can do that you know you can definitely do the punching through that is not a it's not a big issue but you need to have your numbers right. You got to make sure that you know that particular area of uh, you know you're taking out whatever the concrete through that is sufficient to transfer your loads in other load paths. That's a, that's the thing. Structural engineers, the, you know, they are, we are the best profession in the world, so we can do anything. But we got to make sure that we are doing the right thing. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Um, we have a question from John. John's based in South Australia. Good evening, John. And he's directed this to Joe asking, um, what changes would you see in manufacturing of precast concrete? And what role does architect architectural concrete play in the future? Um, yeah, I suppose two, two questions there. The, the, you know, hopefully a, a great role um, you know, it has a great future. Look, look across the rest of, of the world and, and how readily it, it's being adopted. Um, the thing that we've got to do um, in order to make that adoption is improve our knowledge of it and, um, you know, go, go through what Sean and I and many of you clearly who are, are in this session tonight um, have gone through. We need, we need to learn how to make precast work really, really well. You know, I think we've both, we've both spoken about how... Um, it matches extremely well, if not a lot better in some cases, particularly when you take the time components in, into consideration. And, um, you, you know, I, I, I am from the UK. You probably all see that on, on, on LinkedIn. We're doing hospitals fully prefabricated now. And we are talking about years in advance of, of traditional methods of construction. So, you, you know, it's, it's not, we don't have to do any more assessment of, of whether this works or not. It's pretty clear that, that it does. So, we improve our understanding and um, yeah uh, and then the nice thing is when we've got the understanding it just it's on the architectural piece yeah you know I, I, I love the look of concrete you know as, as many people do um, in an architectural application I, I think it looks beautiful Le learn how to do it right such that you, you know the things that are difficult you you can feel them or, or you're clever about how you express them and um, yeah architecture it's, it's a great solution. Uh, thank you for that, Joe. Um, we had a question uh, about a particular project from Brad, and Brad is talking about a Sydney project that's, that has had issues, supposedly had PC panels poured in the morning and eight hours later lifted, supposedly high early strength concrete. 
is this a typical solution with precast? And I don't know who would like to pick that one up, Sean? Oh, Joe. Yeah, no, I'm happy to say that. Um, can you, uh, just, uh, uh, you, you want to take that, Joe? Yeah. Yeah, and then if it did infill anything um, you need, I, I, you know, I, I, I really like the double wall system. Um, it, it's fantastic. Uh, we, uh, yeah. and, and, you know, you should always look to uh, pour concrete as, as the same day that, that you place them. You know, it's more common that you keep the props in to give that additional um, level of stability. You shouldn't be striking it until the earpads strike you, to, um, whatever the necessary structure is. Six hours is, is very, very unusual. You know, I, I wouldn't see that. Is a minimum, if nothing else, because you've got to process the cube, the, the information on the, on the strike cubes, and uh, make sure every concrete strength. So, no, I wouldn't say is it not impossible. There are some great concrete mixes out there, perhaps not normal. Anything to add, Sean? No, that's it. You know, the concrete strength. You know, if you if you achieve the concrete strength, you know, that's the most important part. You know, you kind of without that one, I sometimes you know, you know, without that, you know, in, when I go to factory, I got a fifteen fifteen rule. As people ask because sometimes they forget about that. You know, Sean, what is fifteen? I said fifteen hours, fifteen MPA. You know, so that they remember <laughs> that. You know, no, no, something like that. You could keep them moving, but you know, we can we can we can achieve whatever we want to do. But you, somebody has to make sure that they achieve what you want. Otherwise, you. you it's a, it's a disastrous thing. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, guys. Um, we've had a question uh, came in from Dennis in Victoria, asking what are the essential differences in design and detailing between load bearing panels and panels fixed to a steel frame. Sean, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, I can answer. So one is uh, so one is what they're saying is. Uh, load bearing precast and the other one is the non load bearing precast isn't it that's what uh, they are talking about so the uh, load bearing precast of course the joints are very important if it is an external one i i showed you that you know uh, that external thing you know you could make sure that your um, the ship lab joints you know the, the waterproofing joint has to be grouted properly but not only that one that, that the grouting uh, bearing area is important um you know if the if it is fixed to the steel frame you know how that is laterally restraint is very important actually you know what how that connections have been done that uh, so that there is just hanging from uh you know steel frame you know that is the difference between a non-load bearing and a load bearing precast that's what that's what i would say uh joe you want to add anything on that Matt? no agreed mate yeah thanks sean I hope uh, that is the uh, answer to the question because there is there is a lot of issues with non-load bearing and load bearing and people halfway through they make that as a load bearing you know don't do that actually you know because somebody have a smart idea they come and tell you hey you know even the architects will come you know can we make that load bearing now no don't do that actually halfway through the project you know that is always uh, you know confuses people and that's what uh, you know, some, and I told you about the, the ship lab joint, you know, sometimes if it is a non-load bearing, you put the joint at the middle. So, so, so you don't need enough bearing, but if it is a load bearing, that only the nip has to be about 50 mil. So you have, you have more uh, bearing area. So that's two different things. And also the dowels through there has to be perfect and things like that. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm going more and more, but you know that person can always write to us and and if he has a certain uh, you know specific problem i can answer that you know to the email yeah oh thank you sean for that um we've had a question from Do john who's up in the northern territory asking uh, to joe uh, joe could you provide advice and guidance on the best ways to waterproof exterior precast concrete walls both above and below ground yeah, that's a great question. You, you know, below below ground is is the you, normally the, the one way you get your problems, isn't it? And uh, generally speaking, you, you you would address your your waterproofing the same way that you do an RC wall. Um, double wall systems are particularly good in basements because you, you you reduce the amount of excavation that you do. You don't need a, a scaffold on the excavation side to recast and um, to, to, to build the wall in by traditional methods. And propping goes on, on the inside to the to the ground floor slab uh, or your basement slab and um, so it's you know it's a great application the, the, the second part that's good about it is that the concrete infill is continuous across all the panels so you 
in effect, you get a continuous RC wall out of a precast wall, which you know everyone would would realise. Well, that's that's an excellent solution. Uh, there's loads of membrane systems, and you know it wouldn't be right of me to to, to describe uh, or prescribe um, any particular membrane system to go on the back, but they tend to work pretty pretty well. Um, you know, on top of that, the normal discipline of, of permeable materials, thin drains at the bottom to, to relieve the pressure on the wall anyway, and that just just helps the whole solution. Doesn't it? So. You know, generally speaking, no special treatment just because it's it's a precast wall, which which is an advantage. Uh, and, yeah, and so, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Don't and don't go anywhere, Joe, because we've had a great question from Louise in South Australia, and yeah. Louise is asking you: manufacturing precast concrete off-site can sometimes lead to a lot of double handling. How can this be minimized as to ensure the possibility of damage to the precast concrete member is minimized and it maintains its integrity? Yeah, and another good one. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I hope I gave you some good information in the, uh, the presentation there that, that answered some of your questions. Uh, as always, you know, we're reliant on, on some of the great workers that, that we have in Australia, the great construction workers, skilled crane teams, because we tend to handle this. Uh, using cranes, because obviously it's pretty heavy. Um, good discipline, you know, good good toolbox talks, good people emphasizing the importance and, you know, where possible, minimize the amount of times you have to handle something. But I was very deliberate in showing you that um, OTE system that we had to handle five times to get it into its final location. But, you know, it was absolutely worth the, the you know, go, going through that process. You imagine just doing something that's 12 meters in the air, 3.3 kilometers long by an in-situ method. And just imagine how difficult that would be by comparison. So again, it's, it's all an assessment, you know, the basis of, of the golden rules. Um, what, what is it a big enough advantage? If it isn't, then, then take a sanity check. Gen generally speaking, in most applications it will be. Thanks, Joe. Um, Sean, this might be our last question. Um, and it's a question that's coming from Graham, who's in New South Wales. Um, he has two questions actually, but the first question is, uh, what are the best ways to ensure continuity across precast panels in the vertical and horizontal planes, PT bar plus couplers, <laughs> strand or voided sections with projecting rear for subsequent grouting? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question again. I think you know, Joe's have shown some you know in the vertical at the moment in you know, the vertical and horizontal joints are easy easy solutions. Are of course, um, uh, grout tubes. Even uh, vertical vertical joints are always grout tube is the easy one. But you know, sometimes uh, you know with the design requirement, you may have to have some couplers because you got sometimes you know permanent tension cases are there in 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 buildings. Permanent tension cases. Uh, um, you know, uplift cases and things like that. We have to have uh, um, um, uh, what you call couple of bars. So again, it is the uh, it is the, it is the manufacturing uh, process that we need to make that happening correctly. And in fact, you know, he asked about the PT. You know, I have, I'm telling you, the PT is the best way of uh, uh, getting joint because it has got the P on A. I call it as P on A, which is the stress, you know, they put together very quickly, very easily. I, I always tell that these people, you know, the bridges, if you take, you know, 130, 140 meter bridges, it's simple, small, small pieces, and they put the tension together, isn't it? So, so yes, uh, Brandon, you, 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 it is the innovative thing that we should do. We must get the uh, high rise building cores or even walls. We can. Uh, we can do PT. Definitely, we can do PT uh, with that one. Uh, even the horizontal ones, horizontal slaps, you can do PT, or horizontal wet joints and things like that. We can do that one. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sean. Might just finish on a question for Joe uh, from Leopold in Victoria. Um, he's studying. He says, "I'm currently studying the idea of recycling waste material in precast concrete. What do you think about the idea of this?" I love the idea of this, and well done, Leopold, for for studying it and hopefully bringing some innovation to the industry. And that's uh, wouldn't it be wonderful? We use you know an incredible amount of concrete in the world. We know it's a, a major contributor 
Um, so, it, you know, I, I have no expertise on it. I, I'm working on a project at Sydney University at the moment, uh, and I know that's something that they, that they have recently been I can only encourage it, it you know, if, if, if that, that takes concrete to, uh, it, it, you know, maybe it takes them to greater strengths and uh, a, a more sustainable product, then that's industry point of view, that's fantastic. So best of luck with, uh, with, with your studies and innovation. Hope you uh, get some great out of that. Yeah. Thanks. I think. Thank you, Sean. Would you like to just comment on that, maybe just for yeah, the young? Yeah, people? I, I, I think you know that's yeah, a that, that's a very good idea. The only thing I was worry worried about it is the early strength. You know, if you can develop the early strength with that recycled material, you know, you may have to add something <laughs> because you know there are a lot of uh, recycled materials available. But only problem at the moment is the early strength of those things because precast lifting need a bit bit early strength. But you know. It doesn't mean that you know they can't uh, come up with a solution to get that early strength. Uh, yeah, that's what that's the only thing. But always go for the recycled material. I, I always encourage people to go for the recycled material as much as possible. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Sean. And I think that's um, about all we have time for this evening. Um, please thank you for attending tonight and join me once again in thanking Dr. Shan Kumar and Joe Thompson for their time, giving up their valuable time and insight shared at tonight's presentation. As always, we're looking for your feedback so we can improve and pl when planning future sessions. And if you could please complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description below. Once again, I'd like to thank our industry partner, Austral Precast, for making tonight's webinar possible. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you all at our next webinar. Thank you.